With England in the final of a major international tournament for the first time since 1970, International Match of the Day tomorrow evening previews the European Football Championship and assesses the potential of the competing countries. That's International Match of the Day with Jimmy Hill tomorrow evening at 10.20. Now on BBC One, David Bellamy visits the island of Crete, possibly the legendary Atlantis, as he continues his personal view of the European countryside in Bellamy's Europe. There's nothing like it. Beach combing in the South Seas. Well, at least as far south as I can get in Europe. I'm just about to cross the international date line. And if you don't believe me, well, look over here. <laughs> and there it is, a date palm. And there's not just one, there's all several acres of them here around about. And this is the only place in the whole of the Mediterranean where you can wade ashore and walk through a grove of natural date palms. And of all the plants in the world which say the tropics, well, it's the palm tree. Oh, I know you're going to say, I've seen palms and even date palms planted in nice straight rows round the Riviera and one thing or another, but they've been planted there for ornament. As far as we know, these got themselves here and they've stayed here and grown. And we know that because they've changed a bit. Now, the ordinary date palm is called Phoenix Dactylifera. Phoenix, I reckon, because it rides out of the hot desert sun. Dactylifera, well, you look at it. Everything looks rather hand-like, this great finger-like mass of whacking great leaves. And then there's the leaf itself, and they're enormously spiny. Ooch. But again, fingers coming off a central uh, leaf stalk. And then the great mass of dates just beginning to grow up here. Again, great finger like massy hanging off the flowering stalk. So, Phoenix Dactylifera, not a bad name. But this one's got an extra name. It's called Var Theophrastae. And we reckon, well, it's lived here in isolation for so long from all the other date palms in the world that it is now slightly different. And it's been named after Theophrastus, who was a very, very famous Greek botanist. And so it should be, because these date palms are at Vi on Crete, of course, in Greece. Isolated in the warm waters of the Aegean, what better place to be marooned? And of all the islands, Crete is perhaps the best. At one end, you can bathe in the splendour of the tropics, while not so far away, you can freeze in the heights of the Arctic. Well, almost, because up here on the White Mountains, well, they had a pretty harsh winter, and the snow lays right through spring and into early summer. Now, if poor old Theophrastus' date palm down there on the coast at Vi felt isolated, how about being a plant up here? Now, this is just one of the great range of mountains, the backbone of Crete, but they sit in, oh, a great sea of very, very dry island, and that sits in a sea of sea, and the next lot of mountains are miles and miles away. So a plant here really is going to be isolated from the nearest population of the same sort of plant, and therefore it might just about start to go its own sweet way. You can imagine a seed falls down here and then a population begins to develop fitting itself into this particular pretty harsh environment colder them into hot and dry in the summer and it changes look at this i think this is the most beautiful of all the little crocuses crocus sebali beautiful white petals inside and then yellow deep down in the throat yellow filaments the anther a wonderful coral red stigma but a very very exciting thing this lilac color in bands across the back of the petals now you see it's changing a little bit and it's called the variety heterochromus many colors you see perhaps it's just on its way to becoming another species and if it was and then it only lived here it would be called an endemic because an endemic plant only is found in one place and when you go through the floor of the creek you'll find many plants 
plants are called something or other cretica, which in some cases means they only are found in Crete, they are endemic to Crete. And one of the most beautiful of these, I reckon, is the little white cyclamen that grows in the shelter of these very, very spiny bushes here. And that is only found in Crete, cyclamen creticum. But two things you've got to sort of slot yourself in between up here on the White Mountains. There's the snow because that lies very late and the goats because they're working their way up and they're going to be knocking this lot quite soon. No kidding, goats are the scourge of any flora because, well, they'll eat just about anything without a thought for the fact that they may be dining on some rare endemic plant. I well remember on an expedition losing two tea towels and a brace of thermometers, all to the local herd. And where there aren't goats, well, there'll probably be sheep, which must be reckoned amongst the world's most efficient lawnmowers. Mind you, long before the Cretan shepherds began to watch their flocks, there were other grazing animals doing the job, and none more beautiful than the shy Cree-Cree, -cree, as endemic to Crete as any of the plants it eats. Unfortunately today, it is restricted to some remote corners of the island where it flaunts its massive horns in protected isolation. So it is that the Cretan vegetation has, over the years, come to terms with its own very special brand of short back and sides. Now, much of the landscape of Crete is covered in this stuff, and it's called Fragana, and it's absolutely terrible vegetation to have to walk through because all the plants, or nearly all the plants, are covered with spines. You see, because the real problem for the vegetation down here are all those grazing animals, especially the goats. So even plants all like a salad burnet, which all with us, well, they're delicate herbs, nice and soft things to eat, are here covered in the great mass of the most wicked spines on top but it still proves it's a salad burnet because it's pollinated by the wind and there are the anthers hanging out. Now, there are two ways in which plants can protect themselves against all those rotten goats. One is to produce this great mass of spines and prickles and thorns and things, and the other, well, it's a bit more crafty. It's to arm themselves with a rotten smell or taste. Now, as you come wandering through the Fergana, you are absolutely overcome by overpowering smells of one sort or another, and one of the real stinkers is this sage. Now, oh, I wish you could smell it, because I don't think I'd like to use that with my onions. And perhaps that explains why the snail down there would rather rather eat the spiny ones than the sage over there. So there you've got it, two of the adaptations, the barbed wire plants and the stinkers of the Fergana. But it's not just the problem of the grazing down here in the dry part to creep. The other real problem the vegetation has to put up with is the long, dry summer. Now, most of these plants just sit doggo throughout the summer, but now, during the spring, and it's raining today, really life is beginning to seethe underneath the ground. For down there, a whole lot of really switched-on plants called the geophytes. And they spend the long summer estivating, summer hibernating down below the ground as bulbs, corms or rhizomes. And as soon as the rains of spring come, up they pop. And some of them really are weird. How about that for a flower? Um, this plant doesn't really produce a petals at all, just the sepals form this peculiar trumpet-like thing, and it's called the Dutchman's pipe. But some of the geophytes are peculiar like this, but others are much, much more beautiful. <laughs> Geophyte means the plant of the ground, and they lie in wait, as it were, living on the food stored in their underground parts, and when the conditions are just right, spring into bloom. The variety is staggering. Everywhere there are different colours, different shapes, and none more beguiling than the beautiful bee orchids. Now, these aren't great flamboyant, stick it in your buttonhole and vie with the size of your bosom type orchids. They needn't be, because each one is perfection in miniature. 
Now, there's no getting away from the fact that some of them do resemble insects, both in shape and in colour. And this entomological mimicry is not entirely fortuitous. It is, in fact, all a matter of pseudo-copulation. Insects are attracted to the flowers, not only because of the nectar they secrete, but perhaps because of their resemblance to their lady loves. The flower, you see, promises satisfaction on two counts. And during this dubious double act, the insect may help to pollinate the flower. And now we can see how the process of pseudo-copulation is meant to work. Now, there's the Cretan bee orchid, and imagine I'm a bee, and I suppose I'd have to be a Cretan bee, and in I come. Now, I think it's my lady love, and I come in for a close look, but for I know it's a flower, but at least there's plenty of nectar in there, so in goes, and imagine the little sticks my proboscis, in I go to get out the nectar. Now, you can see what happens as I come back, the two pollinia, the pollen sacs, have now got stuck on my head. So, I fly along, find another flower, and go through the whole shamozzle all over again. But this time, of course, I leave those two pollen sacs behind, right on the receptive stigma, that the pollen is now going to pollinate the flower. And everyone goes away content. So it is that the geophytes fit themselves into the cycle of the Mediterranean year, and even the bees get into the act, carving out their own particular pattern of buzzing life. In the same way, the Cretan farmers have carved out their own patterns, green terraces laddering their way up what otherwise are barren hillsides. For them, the hot blue skies of summer are the time for rest. For it is only the clouds and the mists of winter and spring that hold the promise of a new crop next year. Water is the essence of all life, which will blossom forth a new each spring. the blossoms will eventually turn to fruits, but it's the green leaves that are storing the energy to tide them over the long, hot summer ahead. Man and nature cash in on the same cycle, taking advantage of whatever it has to offer. On the Lasithi Plain, 10,000 wind pumps stand idle throughout the wet period, waiting like giant mechanical insects to sail into summer, when they will draw on the energy of the hot, dry winds to lift irrigation water up from the limestone rocks below, a new pattern of life evolved by man. age-old methods of agriculture are still in use. And not just to please the tourists either, they fit into the scale of the tiny fields between all those fantastic pumps. Yeah. Two bullet power draws a plough which scratches the surface of the soil just deep enough for the planting of a whole range of crops but leaving all those geophytes down there intact. <laughs> 200 horsepower is a very different matter. Although it does make for an easier life for the farmer, the plough really gets itself dug right in. Unfortunately, it's not just the noise of the tractors that mucks up the whole team. Look at me geophytes, all thrown up onto the surface. Now, 
For some of them, like the celandine, well, perhaps it's not too bad because always the ploughing has disturbed it. You can see how it's beautifully adapted with this great mass of small tubers, and they'll get broken up, and at least one or two may live to flower another day. But with the new strength of the tractors, well, the plough digs deep and rips everything up. Now, how's that for an energy store? You see, at one time that would have been safe deep down in the damp soil, but now it's been brought to the surface and it's chucked there and will dry and die in the summer sun. Ironical, isn't it, that just as much of the world is at last talking about an alternative, gentler technology, Crete is coming into the clamour of the 20th century. Many of the wind pumps are falling into decay, their silent sails replaced by the harsh roar of motor pumps, which drag the water up into this, the plastics age. The face of Crete is changing. A shimmering lake in the distance distills itself into the reality of plastic sheeting. But it does have its compensations. What an absolutely super place. Spring in Polythenia. Now, I usually have to tell you, don't pick flowers. But here I can pick a bunch from my mum, because they're grown just for that purpose. You see, the Cretan farmer's gone the whole hog, and inside these great polythene greenhouses, well, he can control the harsh environment, just a little warmer in the early days of spring, and then nice and humid through into the summer, so he can grow a great range of beautiful plants and all sorts of exotic fruit and veg. And perhaps the only ironical thing about it is that this beautiful iris was grown where perhaps once the endemic Cretan iris itself came into bloom each spring. It's a pity they don't smell. Like all the technology of the plastics age, this is impermanent. The greenhouses are environmentally degradable. And although the plastic is not, in amongst the ruins of the sheets of Polythenia, wild flowers still bloom, and even the Cretan iris raises its perfect head. Now, my guidebook says that that's a lily, but I reckon it could just as well be a Crete iris. There are the beautiful curled back petals, and there's the bit in the middle which eventually develops into the long seed pod with the seeds popping out the end. But whatever sort of plant it is, well, it shows that the Minoan culture which developed here on Crete all, almost 5,000 years ago liked their flowers just as much as I do. Now, much as the Minoan may have liked their flowers, they must have really had quite a big effect on the floor of the Crete, because they were quite advanced agriculturalists and built large towns and palaces all over the place. Now, one of the reasons I like the great palace here at Knossos is that the archaeologists haven't just left us piles of stones with notices on and then left it up to us to translate it, but they've done some reconstruction, just odd bits, so one can get the real feeling of what the palace and the town was like here. Now, this is one of those places that I could spend weeks just walking around, but even a quick look will show you that the Minoan culture was very, very advanced. Oh, it's not just the beautiful pillars and the wonderful wall decoration, the intricate patterning, but the whole design of the palace fitted into the side of the hill, and the fact that underneath it is an intricate system of plumbing. Yeah, the Minoans may have even invented the flash loo way back when, what, my great, 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 or oh, I don't know how many great grandfather was still rushing round an ancient Britain in skins and hiding in caves and things. And I must say, looking at some of these things makes me wish I was an archaeologist, because putting all this lot back together, especially these giant storage jars, must be like doing a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. But one thing always worries me going round an archaeological site like this, why did the civilization come to an end? The remains of 6,000 years of another age, and that's permanent, at least on the polythene scale. However, in real environmental terms, even that is degradable. One thousand five hundred BC, the island of Thera, only sixty miles from Crete, blew its top 
to become the Caldera of Santorini. All that rock shifted in one gigantic cataclysm, displaced an awful lot of seawater, and the shock wave radiated out across the Aegean. Malia on the north coast of Crete, it all looks too peaceful. But out there, not all that far away, is the island of Thera. And you can guess the terror as these vast waves of destruction came rolling in, 100, perhaps 200 feet high. And the real problem was that the Minoan culture was one based on trade routes. So they were absolutely dependent upon all the villages, the ports and towns here close to the coast. And of course, these were in the front line of destruction. Now, perhaps you'd have been lucky if you'd have lived in a place like this because you'd have been killed off quite quickly. Because there was worse, much worse yet to come. The volcano continued to spew out its vehemence in the form of a dust called Tesla, an enormous cloud rising up to cover the surrounding area in a blanket of death, but not of destruction. In fact, just the reverse, a cloak of preservation. Today, we can thank the blanket of Tefra for preserving much of the best of the Minoan culture. And on Santorini itself, there are still whole towns complete with frescoed hoardings waiting to be untefered. It's painstaking work, but well worth the effort. A final dust away and everything will be revealed. The secrets of past civilizations coming into the light of this century. Who knows what other surprises lie beneath these great banks of dust? Impressive as the great cliffs of Tefla on the island of Santorini may be, or evidence of some gigantic volcanic cataclysm, there's good evidence that much of the mainland of Minoan Crete was also covered by a blanket of Tefla, but only about all 10 centimetres deep. Now, it's cheating a bit. This isn't Tefla, in fact, it's just an old downwashed deposit. But it's very much like the stuff, and you can see the effect. It blanketed everything out, killing it off. Now, 10 centimetres doesn't seem much, but it's enough all to strip the leaves off the trees of the orchard and certainly to ruin the crop for that year, and so the experts say, to ruin or to make agriculture very, very difficult for many years to come. And you see, the poor old Minoans were now in real bad trouble. Many of them have been killed off in the first great earthquakes and those massive tidal waves, and then their sea ports, their sea routes were smashed, and now their agriculture had had it. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing, but Plato had described another civilization. He called it Atlantis, a civilization which, like the Minoans, all worshipped the bull and built wonderful palaces and towns, great complexes into the hills with nice straight lines and tapering pillars, pillars that tapered from the bottom upwards. A culture lost under a sea. Under a sea, perhaps, of Tesla. Perhaps the fact do fit. Perhaps Plato's Atlantis and the great culture of Minoa are the same thing. Now, it's going to take a long, long time and a lot more research before that is proved or disproved. But what we do know is that the Tesla slowly eroded away and then got moulded to form new, productive, fertile soils. Soils which now support the most diverse flora of the whole of the European spring. It's just like walking through an illustrated flora. Each step turns another page. New species, new genera, families, flowers, fruits, leave the lot, all waiting to be identified. Cretan catchflies dance in the breeze, close beside the globe-like head of the Italian orchid. A coiled fruit that looks more like a snail than a legume, and a trefoil which shows its allegiance to the same family of plants. And those are the fruits of a wild carrot, wild man.
The little gladiolus nods its pink head, almost hidden by drifts of yellow chrysanthemums, each one a facet of colour in this, the most ephemeral scene of spring, for in a month's time this will be dead and dry. Just think, the fallow fields of Britain once looked like that before we used the tractor and the selective herbicide. Now, I've picked three flowers, but I've picked them for a very special purpose. I've got a buttercup, an anemone, and a poppy. Now, until I came to Crete, I reckon I knew the difference between me common flowers, but it's not so easy here. Buttercup, anemone. And you've really got to look at them quite closely. A red buttercup, but it gives itself away because there behind the delicate petals are the sepals, and those closed round and protected the flower when it was in bud, whereas the anemone has no sepals at all. The beautiful petals come back, and the protection was given by these rather leafy bracts, now quite a long way down the flower stalk. Oh, you might say, a poppy? Well, that's too easy. But I don't know, you know, the same delicate sort of feel about it, and even inside the flower, it looks looks much the same, but the test here is, well, break it, and there it begins to bleed, and it bleeds a coloured latex, and the Papaveraceae, the poppy family, is one of the few families in the world which actually produce coloured latex. Now, on the ends of this bluff, there are two great palaces of the Minoans, and you can't really blame them putting them here. And I wonder, were these truly the gardens of Atlantis? Whatever the answer to that question may be, there's no getting away from the fact that the Minoans like their plants and animals, and I reckon that both their palaces and their lifestyle must have fitted with perfection into the Cretan landscape. Trust me to come to Crete and the wettest spring on record. But the exciting thing is, whichever civilization you come to see, and here at Gortis they've uncovered three of them, all Minoan, Byzantine and this wonderful Doric amphitheatre, each one has created perfect places on which chasmophytes can grow. Chasmophytes are plants that grow on the walls of chasms, and Crete is gorged with chasms and vertical cliff faces, which are absolutely ideal for the hanging-on lifestyle. These plants make their home in nooks and crevices where larger plants could never get a root hold, and so they can live their lives out free from competition, keeping all the time well out of trouble. A high lifestyle ideal for avoiding tefla, and walls are just as good a habitat as any cliff. Yes, if any plants of Atlantis are still hanging on in modern Crete, these are they. The chasmophytes could well be the remains of the hanging gardens of Atlantis. You know, and wandering around these ruins, all you could almost imagine that civilizations never existed, but that some very talented and vast capability brown has come round Crete and built these marvellous ruins just to show off me plants. The trouble is that our 20th century civilization goes and plasters it with paraquat to keep the plants away. And the irony is that it just keeps the delicate, more beautiful plants at bay and leaves the hearty, rotten weeds boring into the stonework. I don't know. Perhaps it's just kind of I'm a botanist, but I get the feeling that you can't have a civilization that's worth its name, be it ancient or modern, that doesn't look after its flowers. <laughs> ¶¶